back to mission control, and this time we're going for orbit. Oh look, we got another swivel test contract. <laughs> I mean, sure. Do it again. Okay, uh, I don't think there's any building upgrades I need to do this time. Back to R&D, so we need to unlock new parts. Again, uh, looking for new science experiments. The Science Junior. And then better rockets. We're actually probably not going to use these. But here, in advanced rocketry, you have the Terrier engine. And the Terrier is your bread and butter for space travel. Um, it has a very high ISP, which means it's very efficient. It doesn't use a lot of fuel to get where it needs to go. And it's very light, which also makes the rest of your rocket more efficient. So the Terrier is really, really crucial for progressing. Um, and just for fun, there's a couple of different ways you can build this rocket. Um, no, I, I'll, I'll do it the other way. Okay. I'll kind of go through the, the rocket design here a little bit too, so you can explain that. So we're going to pull off that, so we're going to completely rebuild this. But our science package is still pretty good. We're going to leave that in place. One thing you can do here, um, I didn't talk about before. Uh, there's a little bit of monoprop in the command pod, and this is extra weight. Monoprop is fuel for RCS thrusters, which is usually used for docking, um, but we don't need it. Like, it costs money, not a lot, and there's a little bit of weight associated there, so you can take it out. So we're going to want a heat shield this time. He's coming back from orbit is a lot faster. And then, just like the monoprop, we can take out this ablator. Ablator is a resource that burns away to reduce heat and shed heat. Um, but ablator is actually pretty heavy. And you don't need it for something so light as this thing returning from space. Um, the base heat tolerance of the heat shield is high enough that you don't actually need the ablator. Uh, ablator is kind of useful maybe for uh, doing aero braking at EVE, which has a really hot and dense atmosphere. Uh, but for Kerbin, we don't need it. And, and this is even true for returning to Kerbin from really distant planets. Like, as long as the ship you're returning is pretty light, like this one is, uh, you don't need a blader. Okay, now I put a decoupler underneath. Um, quick note, there are two attachment nodes for the heat shield. Uh, it doesn't matter which one you use. The lower one will create this little shroud. I think that's kind of ugly, so I put it there. It doesn't matter. Alright, and again, put the parachute in the same stage as the decoupler. Now, I'll, I'll go through the design process here a little bit. I usually use a FLT-400 for the terrier. Oh, here's another note. If you do put the decoupler there, make sure that you don't accidentally attach your fuel tank to the heat shield node. If you see that shroud pop up, this thing is actually attached to the heat shield. It's not attached to the decoupler. That's better. Okay, so one of these and a terrier is usually a pretty good combination. Um, a good rule of thumb is for each liquid engine, you want to have about two minutes of burn time. Uh, and if you expand this window down here, you can see the burn time is 113 seconds. So like that amount of fuel for the terrier engine is pretty much perfect. I might adjust this in a minute, um, depending on what the rest of the rocket looks like. But this is kind of a good, good starting point. Oh, I did forget one thing. Uh, we got our new experiment with Science Junior. So the Science Junior um, is sort of like the Mr. Gu in that it can only be run once uh, unless you have a science scientist to reset it. Uh, however, it also has very, very low heat tolerance and impact tolerance. So I usually don't bother trying to recover it. One thing you can try, if you want, is a configuration like this. Um, where you try to bring back the Science Junior itself. This could be dangerous, because if the Science Junior explodes, now your heat shield is no longer attached to your ship. So I just don't even bother trying. Because remember, on EVA, we can take the data out, store it in the capsule, so we still get the science data back. We just won't get the price of the Science Junior returned. 
Okay, so that's the upper stage. Put another decoupler down here. And then again, like the uh, parachute and decoupler, I usually put the engine in the same stage as the decoupler below it. And that way I only have to press space once to activate both of these. I don't have to press space twice. Okay, and now we're going to add some more fuel tanks. I'm going to start with four, and then we'll adjust as the uh, stats indicate. So once again, four, four tanks there is 117 seconds of burn time. So that's a good starting point, but we're going to have to adjust this a little bit, I think. Now, um, DV. Let's talk about DV calculator here. To get to orbit, you need about 3,400 meters per second of DV. Your total DV is in this orange box at the bottom right. Bafflingly, uh, KSP will show you the stats relative to sea level by default. When you're talking about DV, you are almost always talking about vacuum DV. And the reason that matters is the Terrier engine up here has a very different efficiency in, in atmosphere versus vacuum. So at sea level, I would have 558 meters per second of DV on that stage. In vacuum, I have 2,264. It's a huge, huge difference. And, and for DV, we always care about the vacuum number. Okay, so our target is 3,400. We have 4,700. It's more than enough. Now, so the two things you want to check for your rocket design are your total, total vacuum DV, make sure you have enough. There are DV maps out there that will tell you uh, how much you need to do different things. Right now we're just going to orbit, so it's 3400. Uh, and then the second thing you want to check is the sea level thrust to weight ratio of your first stage, your launch stage. Uh, if it's less than one, you can't take off. Your, your ship is too heavy. Thrust to weight ratio is kind of a measure of your acceleration relative to gravity. Um, 1.5 to 2 is generally a pretty good range. Uh, you want to go higher if you're using some SRBs uh, and lower if it's liquid only. 1.17 is a little too low. Now the good news is because our DV was so much higher than the, than the target, right? We want 3,400, we have 4,700. We can take away some fuel and that'll bump up the thrust to weight ratio a bit. So I'm going to take away that fuel tank and replace it with this one and a smaller one. So this is three quarters as much fuel as I had before. So let's see what that did to the numbers. First, vacuum DV is now 4,500. It went down by 200, but still well above what we need. Sea level uh, thrust to weight ratio is 1.22. So it went up a little bit, but still probably not enough. But again, our DV is higher than we need it. So maybe let's try taking a fuel tank off here. Okay, vacuum DV is 4,088, still high enough. Sea level thrust to weight ratio, 1.45. That's great. For, for a liquid only engine, you can afford to have a slightly lower thrust to weight ratio um, because it's only gonna be increasing during the entire time it's burning. Oh, this got messed up, there we go. Okay, and then finally I'm gonna add some fins. These basic fins are really cheap and really light. Um, they're not gonna affect your engine stats very much. They do add a little bit of drag, uh, but the extra stability is hopefully worth it. Okay, I think we're good to go. Our first orbital flight. Now, remember that Science Junior, um, up until now we've been doing all of our science on the pad and then multiple times throughout the flight. This thing, because Jeb's not a scientist, can only be run once. And so we're gonna want to run it in the most valuable location uh, we can, which is actually, I'm gonna try and get to high space at 250 kilometers. So I'm not gonna run it until we're up in space. Um, one thing about these experiments that have to have a scientist to reset them, you, you can run them. And what you can do is if you don't like what you see here, if it's not worth very much, you can just click the reset button here. And that's fine, you can run it again later. The thing that makes it not resettable is if you move the data out to somewhere else or transmit it, um, then you won't be able to reset it anymore until you have a scientist. Okay, T for SAS, Z to max throttle, and then spacebar to launch. That should pretty much always be your launch sequence, T, Z, space. 
Now, because the thrust weight ratio is on the lower side, I'm going to go straight up for a while. Normally, I would start turning by now, maybe like 100 meters per second. And we're going to slowly tap the D key, keep the nose right at the edge of that yellow circle. Yeah, so the lower thrust to weight ratio you have, um, the slower you want to turn, the higher the thrust to weight ratio, the faster you want to turn. A good rule of thumb here, too, is um, you want to be halfway to the horizon. That's this ring uh, at 45 degrees, the circle on the nav ball. Um, you want to be there at about 10 kilometers of altitude. So you kind of want to time your ascent, or your turn, so that you're uh, passing that point when you're at 10 p.m. I'm a little bit slow. I'm at 13 or 14. It's not a big deal. Um, doesn't have to be perfect, but that's kind of a good ballpark to shoot for. So we're going to keep get this turn going. Um, because this is kind of a weird rocket, the thrust to weight ratio or the g-force is going to increase a lot towards the end of that stage. If stuff starts to overheat, um, if you see heat bars show up, it's okay to throttle down. In that case, I just ran out of fuel. And I haven't been watching my apoapsis. Okay, it's not high enough yet. We want that to be about 80k. So we're on stage. And really, it's far more efficient to stage immediately, but I wasn't sure if that was too high yet. I was talking. Okay, when the AP is about 80k, uh, stop your burn. And now we coast. We can time warp up to the apoapsis. Once you're over 70 kilometers, um, you can kill time warp. And then when you use time warp, it'll use the non-physics mode time warp. It'll go faster. OK, so we're going to switch to map mode. Oh, I can't see the AP here. That's fine. Right. Okay, we'll do this the fun way. So at apoapsis, your vertical speed, which is shown in this circular dial right here, uh, is going to be exactly zero. And what you want to do is you want to stay right at zero. At least don't let it go negative. And since apoapsis is 81.5, I know I'm right there right now. Okay, so we're going to throttle up. And if if this dial starts going down into the negative, you want to pitch up above the horizon a little bit into the blue part of the nav ball. And that should start coming back up. And what we're doing is we're actually staying right at our AP. This is the highest point of our orbit right here. Uh, and so if it starts going back up again, you pitch back down. And we're just turning left and right to keep that as close to zero as we can. And what you'll notice down here in the bottom left is that the periapsis number, which is currently negative, is getting closer to zero because we're raising our periapsis. And as that starts getting positive, we can throttle back a little bit and kill the engine. So that's actually not a bad orbit. 94 kilometers by 80. Hello, orbital leg on a space station. Welcome. I could have upgraded the tracking station and done this a little bit differently, but it's fine. Oh, <laughs> not leg egg. Yeah, sorry. OK, so we've succeeded at orbit. Now, we still have a lot of fuel left. And here's another little trick about career mode. We've finished our contract for orbiting. You can also usually get a contract for returning from orbit. So you hit escape, you go back to the Space Center, and this is like really min-max strategy. You don't have to do this. Uh -huh. Look for the progression contract. And hey, look, the contract for returning from orbit. That's free money. Because we're about to do it. I'll upgrade the tracking station just because we're going to need it for the next flight anyway. Let's go back to the tracking station and return to your ship. OK. Now, up until this point, 
uh, we've already collected pretty much all the science we can. Um, one thing you can do is the EVA report is can be done over each different biome in orbit. So if you really, really want to maximize science, um, you can just keep doing EVA reports as you pass over different biomes. I'm not going to bother doing that because I know that we're going to have enough. The other thing we haven't done yet is the Science Junior. I could do it now, but what I'm going to do instead is raise my orbit uh, up until the apoapsis is over 250k, which is the boundary for high space. And it's going to move pretty fast. You can see this in map mode too. So you, you can right click on the AP to see it, just keep the number visible. So we're going to go a little bit over 250 so we have time to do the science. And then just warp until we get up to that height. All right, we were slashed to cancel the time warp. And now we're going to do all the science. Materials Bay, see 37.5, it's worth a lot. Mr. Goo. Temperature, pressure, crew report, EVA report. And then remember, we want to take all of the science and store it back in the pod just in case stuff blows up. I think that's all of it. OK, now we need to lower our orbit again so we hit the atmosphere. So turn on SAS, we're going to aim retrograde, that's the yellow circle with the cross in the middle. It should always be near 270 on the nav ball, um, assuming you launch the east. And then we're going to burn until the periapsis is down to uh, about 30 kilometers. And I'm using low throttle because I want to stop it right around there. Okay. We still have 315 meters per second of DV remaining, so that rocket was very, very overbuilt, even with how small it actually was. I kind of I showed that design because um, I know new players probably won't do a turn quite as efficiently as I did, and having extra fuel doesn't hurt. OK, I'm going to aim retrograde and stage off the engine. And bye bye, Science Junior. I like to hit V to switch the camera mode to free so that the ground is below me so I can it just looks nicer. One more tip for reentry. Um, this is showing my orbital speed. If I click here, it shows the surface speed. And if you notice, the retrograde direction very subtly changed. Uh, the wind or the air is stationary relative to the surface. And so if you are pointing retrograde in orbit mode, you're actually at a very, very slight angle to the wind. Uh, but if you're in surface mode and you're pointing exactly retrograde, you will be uh, aiming directly into the wind and everything behind the heat shield will be safe. I mean, once again, I probably don't even need SAS. It's already drifting a little bit. But I'm just pointing that out for future missions. Actually, yeah, I'll just turn off SAS. Now is a good time to make sure that your parachute is armed. Since it was in the stage with the decoupler, it already is. Hehehe. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, I do love their excitement. I have a habit of canceling physics warp before touching the ground. In older versions of the game, you would very often die if uh, you were in physics warp when touching down. It's it's much, much better now, um, but it's something to look out for. And then the last experiment we haven't done yet is the mystery goo in the water. A couple extra points there. Yeah, it's a massive, massive amount of science. And we didn't even do the EVA reports over different biomes. Um, so one note quickly about science. Over here in the Archives tab, if you click Kerbin, or rather, it'll show you what you've done from each different situation. Uh, so if you have like a lower number in one of these categories, like, oh, hey, material study, I've only done twice. Uh, compared to crew report, we've done seven times. You can figure out, okay, which one haven't we, where, what are we missing, right? So we have material study from, actually, I didn't ever recover this one, so I don't even have that one. Uh, we have material study from space high recurbins, which means we're missing all the other situations here. This UI is a little bit confusing. Um, because when you click on something, it'll hide everything else. So it says 29 hidden, which means that there are 29 things that weren't surface landed. And then here we can see flying high. There's only four experiments. It looks like I have, probably have six different experiments, so you can figure out which uh, ones I was missing from flying high. I'm not going to bother collecting every single one, but this is just how you figure out uh, what you've done and what you're missing. 